Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 36 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public. Information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Tom Friedman is an internationally acclaimed reporter, columnist, best-selling author, and three-time recipient of the Pulitzer Prize. He began his career as a correspondent in Beirut with United Press International. In 1981, he was hired by the New York Times to serve as their bureau chief in Beirut and later in Jerusalem. He eventually became the Times' foreign affairs columnist, the job he describes as the one he always aspired to. He's the author of seven best-selling books, including, among others, From Beirut to Jerusalem, a winner of the National Book Award, The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century, and his latest book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Acceleration. Born in Minneapolis and raised in St. Louis Park, he graduated from Brandeis University with a degree in Mediterranean Studies and later earned a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies at Oxford University. He spoke at the Town Hall Forum in May 1991, and for 25 years we've been anticipating his return. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Tom Friedman. You know, as, as uh, Paul Simon said when he and Art Garfunkel did a concert in Central Park, it's great to do a neighborhood concert, okay? <laughs> uh, it's so great because I've been on the road for a month uh, talking about my new book, but I have been so looking forward to being back here uh, at home in the Twin Cities. Tim, thank you for having me. I promise it won't be another 30 years. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so honored that Vice President Mondale is here with us uh, this afternoon. He's been a great mentor for me, and he appears in the book. And the first thing I did say to him when we met this afternoon is, who would you like to play you in the movie? Okay? <laughs> so so uh, let me get right to it. I'm going to speak for about 35 minutes, then we'll open it up for, for, for questions. Um, uh, the book is called Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving, in the age of accelerations. And the first question I always get is, where from the title? Thank you for being late. Um, and it actually comes from meeting people in Washington, D.C. for breakfast over the years. It's where I, where I live now. Whenever people ask me where I live, I say, well, it's a complicated question. I live in Washington, D.C., but I am from Minnesota. So honor that distinction. It's, uh, um, but I meet people for breakfast. I, I don't like wasting um, business breakfast by eating alone, so I like to meet people downtown before work. And uh, over the years, people would come 10, 15 minutes late. Some days they'd say, Tom, I'm really sorry. This is the weather, the traffic, the subway. The dog ate my homework. And um, everybody had a different excuse. And about three years ago, um, uh, a friend of mine, Peter Corsell, met me downtown. He was late and started in with the whole thing. And I just spontaneously said to him, actually, Peter, Thank you for being late. Because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And most importantly, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. Well, people started to get into it. They'd say, well, 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 well you're welcome. Uh, because they understood that I was giving them permission to pause, uh, to slow down, to reflect and reimagine. And boy, don't we need to do a lot of that now. In fact, my favorite quote from the front of the book is from my friend Dove Seidman, who says, you know, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. It starts to reflect, rethink, and reimagine. And boy, don't we need to do a lot of that now. Is that something we can? 
I'm, I'm texting to take care of that problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the sound of progress next door. Our construction oh, 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 site. Oh, yeah. oh, really? Oh, interesting. We will, we will get it shut down. Great. Uh, it's, uh, uh, appreciate it. Don't want to interrupt our, 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 our radio audience. So, um, The book, though, actually began, um, in fact, because I paused and engaged with someone who I wouldn't normally engage with uh, on a daily basis. Um, I live in Bethesda, Maryland now, and I take the subway to work about once a week. So for me, that means driving to the, um, uh, from our home in Bethesda to the Bethesda Hyatt, and I park in the public parking garage uh, beneath the Bethesda Hyatt, and I take the red line into Washington, D.C., where our New York Times Bureau is. And uh, I did that low some three years ago now, and I took the red line in, worked all day, came back, got my car, um, timestamp ticket, uh, drove to the cashier's booth, uh, handed it uh, to the cashier, and he, he looked at it and looked at me and said, uh, I know who you are. I said, great. Uh, he said, I read your column. I said, great. Uh, he said, I don't always agree. I thought, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I actually said, well, that, that's OK. It means you have to check each time, you know. And I drove off. Um, a week later, I took my weekly trip to DC, drove to the Bethesda parking garage, uh, took the red line into DC, my office, came back, car, timestamp ticket, same guys there. This time he says, uh, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog. Would you read my blog? I thought, oh my god. The parking guy is now my competitor? <laughs> what just happened? But I said, look, write it down for me, and I'll look it up. So he wrote it down on a little uh, piece of receipt paper, odenambi.com. And um, I, uh, I took it home, called it up right away on my computer. Turned out he's Ethiopian, writes about Ethiopian politics from the perspective of the Oromo people, real democracy advocate. And it was a good blog. I thought about him for a couple of days. I talked to my wife, and um, I said, you know what? This is a sign from God. I should engage this guy. I should pause. Um, but I didn't have his email, so the only way I could engage him was park in the parking garage every day. <laughs> so uh, I did that for, I don't remember, four or five days. I finally overlapped with him in the morning, 7 a.m. I parked right under the gate so it couldn't come down. I, and I know his name, Ayile. I said, Ayile, uh, I'd like your email. I want to send you a message. Uh, and he gladly gave it to me. And um, I sent him a message that night. And I repeat these, some of them in the book. We had a quite funny exchanges going back and forth. But I basically said to him, I have a proposition for you. I am ready to teach you how to write a column if you will tell me your life story. And he basically said, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. Um, <laughs> so he asked if we could meet near his office at, uh, P near Pete's, Co at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda, um, which we did a couple weeks later. And um, I came with a six-page memo on how to write a column. And, um, and he came with his life story. And uh, his life story is an Ethiopian, um, uh, he was studying economics at Haile Selassie University in Addis Ababa. Uh, it was a real uh, advocate for democracy and, uh, uh, and for the representation of his people, the Oromo people, um, and uh, um, uh, bore himself with the beautiful dignity of an immigrant who was just working in a parking garage be to get the money to really participate today in the global conversation. And um, uh, I was very taken by him and his story. He's basically here as a political exile because the uh, current authoritarian regime in Ethiopia didn't really appreciate his blog. I then uh, gave him a six-page memo, as I said, on how to write a column. And I thought about some of this before, but I'd never put it together this way until we met. And I explained to Ely that um, a new story is meant to inform. I can do a news story about this lecture series. And it can inform better or worse. But a column is meant to provoke. Okay. So I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. <laughs> That's so what I do. I either do heating or lighting. Okay? That is, I'm either stoking up an emotion in you, or I'm illuminating something for you. And if I really do it right, I do both and produce heat and light. And I produce a reaction. But I explained to him 
that to produce heat and light required actually an act of chemistry. And you have to combine three chemicals. Uh, the first is what is your value set? What is the value set you're trying to push in the world? Are you a communist, a capitalist, a neocon, a neoliberal, a libertarian, a, a Marxist, a Keynesian? What is the value set you're pushing? Second, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places in more ways on more days? Because as a columnist, I'm always trying to take my value set and push the machine in that direction. But if I don't know how the machine works, I either won't push it or I'll push it in the wrong direction. So I'm always carrying around in my head a working hypothesis of how the machine works. And all of my books, to some degree or another, have been a take on that. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? How the machine affects different people and culture, and how they in turn affect the machine. There's no column without people, and there are no people without culture. So mix those three together, stir, let it rise, bake for 45 minutes, and if you do it right, you'll produce heat or light. And you'll know from the reaction readers give you. They may say, uh, I didn't know that. That's a good reaction. Uh, I never looked at it what, that way. That, that's a good reaction. I never connected those things. That's a good reaction. Your favorite, you live for this, happens four times a year. You said exactly what I felt, but didn't know how to say, God, God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> That, uh, that tells me I've produced heat or light. Any one of those is fine. It, uh, it tells you you've <coughs> produced heat or light. Well, the more I engage with the, you know, we did uh, three sessions and some online <coughs> back and forth, uh, the more I stepped back and started to say to myself, well, if that's what a column's about, what's my value set? Where did it come from? Because my readers know I'm not quite a liberal, but I'm certainly not a conservative. My, my politics is very eclectic because it didn't come from a library or philosopher. It came from the time and place where I grew up in Minnesota. Because <coughs> I grew up, excuse me. <coughs> because I grew up in a time and place where politics worked. And I have carried that with me for the rest of my life. And um, that's why I am the can't we all just sit down and work this out columnist for the New York Times. <laughs> Where do my politics come from? How do I think the machine works today? And what have I learned all these years about people and culture? And I decided that's the book I wanted to write. And that's what Thank You for Being Late is all about. So let me share with you uh, a little bit of the front section, which is about how the machine works today. Because I think what is shaping more things in more places, in more ways on more days, is that we are in the middle of three exponential accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So Moore's Law, um, coined by Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel in 1965, said that the speed and power of microchips will double roughly every 24 months. It's now closer to 30, but never mind. It's basically held up for 52 years. That is an exponential. And if you put Moore's Law on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. Now, one of the hardest things for the human mind to grasp is an exponential. Uh, to explain it, I, I use two examples in the book. One is from my friends Eric Benjolson and Andy McAfee in their book, The Second Machine Age. They tell the story of the man who um, invented uh, chess, and he gave the game to the king, and the king loved it and said, how can I reward you, good sir? And the man said, your highness, I just want to feed my family. The king said, it shall be done. What would you like? He said, just take one grain of rice and put it on the first square of this chessboard, two on the second, four on the next, eight on the next, 16 on the next. Just keep doubling it and my family will be fine. The king said it shall be done, not realizing that when you double something just 63 times, the number you get is roughly 18 quintillion. Okay. So the engineers at Intel wants to explain the power of the exponential doubling of Moore's law. Um, uh, did a little back of the envelope calculation. They took a 1971 Volkswagen Beetle and they said, what if this Beetle 
had improved at the same rate of microchips at Intel. And they determined that today that beetle would go 300,000 miles an hour, it would get 2 million miles per gallon, <clears throat> and it would cost 4 cents. Okay. That's the power of an exponential. And that's what's going on in Moore's Law. As Andy and Eric say in their book, we just entered the second half of the chessboard when the doubling starts to get really big and you start to see really funky stuff. You start to see cars that can drive themselves and computers that can write songs and win any game of Jeopardy against anybody. But that's not the only exponential we're in the middle of. We're in the middle of another exponential in what I call the market. And that for me is digital globalization, not your grandfather's globalization, not containers on ships. That globalization is actually declining. But digital globalization, the way everything is being digitized and globalized, whether it's MOOCs to, for learning or Facebook or Twitter or PayPal, everything today is being digitized and globalized and in the process is taking our world from interconnected to hyperconnected to interdependent. It's a difference of degree, that's a difference of kind. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And Mother Nature for me is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. We're in the middle of three hockey stick accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. And these accelerations aren't just changing our world, they are fundamentally reshaping our world. And they're reshaping five realms in particular. Politics, geopolitics, the workplace, ethics, and community. And so the first half of the book is about the accelerations, and the second half is about how they're reshaping our world and how we need to reimagine these realms. So let's just go back for a second to Moore's Law, which is really the driver of all of it, because more, Moore's Law drives more globalization, more globalization drives more climate change, and more solutions to climate change. So my chapter on Moore's Law begins it's actually called, What the Hell Happened in 2007? 2007. Sounds like such an innocuous year. What's this guy talking about? Well, here's what I stumbled on in my research. Here's what happened in 2007. In January 2007, Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone at the Moscone Center in San Francisco, beginning a process by which we are now putting into the hands of Everyone on the planet, eventually, a handheld computer with very high bandwidth connected to the cloud. But that's not all that happened in 2007. In 2007, a company called Facebook, actually late 2006, opened its platform up to anyone with a registered email address. Before then, it was confined to high schools and universities. And in 2007, it went global. Uh, in 2007, for the first time, the number of users on the internet crossed one billion people. In 2007, a company called Twitter, which was started in 2006, launched on its own independent platform, and also went global. In 2007, the most important software platform you may have never heard of called Hadoop, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, <laughs> launched its first algorithm into the world. Hadoop is basically the software that helped us in, a, uh, in, in the public way to make a million computers work together as if they were one. In other words, it was the foundation of big data. Google really pioneered it all, but as Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, said to me when I interviewed him, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back home. And what Google did was pioneer this and then share the breadcrumbs, a, a pathway, with the open source community and they reverse engineered it all to create a public version of this, and that really is one of the foundations of big data. In 2007, a company called GitHub, now the world's biggest open source repository of software used by every major company in the world now, also opened its doors. In 2007, a company called Google set off into the wild an operating system called Android. And this same company, Google, in 2007, bought an obscure TV company called YouTube. Uh, in 2007, Jeff Bezos gave the world the world's first ebook reader called the Kindle. 
In 2007, a company called IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. In 2007, three design students in San Francisco who were attending the design conference noticed that there were several people who couldn't get hotel rooms, and they offered them the chance to sleep on their air mattresses. <laughs> um, and in 2007, they launched a company called Airbnb. Uh, in 2007, change.org started, some of them, Palantir started. I've got a graph in the book. It's the cost of sequencing a human genome. You'll notice in the graph at 2001, it was $100 million. Then it quickly goes down to $10 million, and then it goes over a cliff. It goes almost straight down. Trace your finger down to the bottom of the graph, and the date is 2007, down to $1,200 today or less. Uh, in 2007, solar energy took off. In 2007, a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking first took off. And in 2007, this thing we call the cloud, what we consider the cloud today, was born. The numbers for revenue first show up in 2008. Finally, in 2007, Intel, for the first time, went off silicon to build its microchips and introduce non-silicon materials into the transistors to extend the Moore's law exponential. Uh, in short, friends, 2007 may in time be understood as the single greatest technological inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press. And we completely missed it because of 2008. Okay. <laughs> so right when our physical technologies just took off, like we were all in an airport and the, on a moving sidewalk that suddenly went from five miles an hour to 35 miles an hour, and we all felt that, wow, the ground feels like it's moving under my feet. Right when that happened, our social technologies, what Oxford economist Eric Beinhacker calls our social technologies, all the learning, adapting, regulating, deregulating, that we needed to go with that change so we got the best out of it and cushioned the worst, all of that froze. And we are living in that disjunction right now. You know, I always tell people, um, you know, someone was alive when Gutenberg invented the printing press. And some monk, said to some priest, now that is really cool, okay? <laughs> okay, I don't have to write these Bibles out longhand anymore? Would we just stamp, stamp these out? Well, I think we're alive at a similar moment. Now what produced it ba basically is if you take a computer, a computer basically is made of five parts, the, the CPU, the processor, that microchip, the storage chip, the networking, the software, and sensors. Um, Yours has a camera, but sensors generally. <clears throat> and basically what's happened over the last 20 years is that they've all been in a Moore's Law. And they all melded together in 2007 into something we call the cloud. The cloud. But I never use the word the cloud in my book because it sounds so soft, so, so cuddly, so fluffy. Sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. <laughs> I've looked at clouds from... <laughs> this ain't no cloud, folks. Uh, in my book, I call it a supernova. Supernova is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. Because what the convergence of all these technologies did was an incredible release of energy into uh, the hands of people and machines, and almost overnight, it has changed four kinds of power. It's changed the power of one. Wow, what one person can do today. We have a president-elect who can sit in his penthouse and tweet to hundreds of millions of people directly without an editor or a libel lawyer or a filter. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna go there, I'm not, I'm not gonna go there. Don't go there, don't go there, Tom. Don't go there, Tom. Okay. Um, but what's really scary is the head of ISIS can do the same thing from Raqqa province. Oh, this is a great time to be a maker. But when the world is good for makers, it's fantastic for breakers. They've both been super empowered. It's changed the power of machines. Machines now have all five senses. They can think. I was a speaker at IBM's developer conference uh, uh, a month ago. And the day before I went there, IBM Watson um, 
co-wrote a song with Alex the Kid. It went to number four on iTunes in 48 hours. In fact, I think a very important day in our history is February 14, 2011, when on all places, a game show. There were three contestants. Two were the all-time Jeopardy champions. And the third contestant just went by his last name, Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson passed on the first question. But on the second question, he buzzed in before the two humans. The question was, it's worn on the foot of a horse and used by a dealer in a casino. And in under 2.5 seconds, Mr. Watson in perfect Jeopardy language said, what is a shoe? What is a shoe? And for the first time, a computer figured out a pun faster than two human beings. Oh, the world has not been the same since. It's changed the power of flows. Ideas now flow, and ideas change and melt away faster than we've ever seen. Five years ago, Barack Obama said marriage was between a man and a woman. Um, today, blessedly so, he says marriage is between any two human beings who love each other. And he's following Ireland in that position. Think of how quickly things change. And lastly, it's changed the power of many. Because with these amplified powers, we as a collective are now a force of and in nature. The new geophysical era is being named after us, the Anthropocene. So these powers now are really reshaping our world. And that's what the back half of the book is about. And let me just give you a few examples. Let's talk about one that's central, I know, to all, all your lives, the workplace. How is the workplace being reshaped? So I call that chapter in my book, How We Turn AI Into IA. How do we turn artificial intelligence into intelligent assistance, A-N-C-E, intelligent assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms, so more of us can enjoy uh, the, the great benefits of this technology, that more of us can live and thrive in a world where there is this change in the pace of change. So my example of intelligent assistance is the HR department, HR policies of AT&T. Big company, 360,000 employees, lives right on the edge of the supernova, competes every day with Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint. There's a good chance that whatever AT&T is doing in its HR policies may be coming to a neighborhood near you. So here's AT&T's, in a nutshell, their HR approach. So they begin every year now with their CEO, Randall Stevenson, giving a radically transparent speech about where the company is going, what markets they're going to be in, what businesses they're going to be in, and what skills you need today to be an employee at AT&T. Then they put every one of their um, uh, employees on their own in-house LinkedIn system. So they know just whether you're aligned or not with the skills of where they're going. Then they determine, uh, making up the number, but let's say that there are 10 skills you need to work in the AT&T of today. And we'll use Tim uh, for my example. And they come to Tim and say, Tim, you're doing well. You've got seven of the 10 we see here, but you're missing three. Uh, then they partnered with Sebastian Thrun from Udacity and created online nano degrees for all 10, including the three Tim is missing. One of them actually is an online uh, computer science master's degree from Georgia Tech for $6,000. Uh, then they came to Tim and said, Tim, here's the deal. If you take these three courses, we'll give you up to $8,500 a year to take these courses. And by the way, if you want to, under, want to, want to take a course in archaeology, uh, religion, we'll pay for that too. Uh, but there's just um, uh, one catch. You have to take these courses on your own time. Now, if Tim says, you know, I've climbed up one too many telephone poles. I'm just not ready to do this anymore. AT&T has a wonderful severance package now for Tim. But Tim won't be working at AT&T much longer. Their bargain with him, and I believe it's the basis of the new social contract in our society, is um, if Tim takes those courses, then AT&T says, we will offer you the new jobs first. We won't go outside. Their basic social bargain with Tim is that he can be a lifelong employee at AT&T as long as he is a lifelong learner. And that is the new social contract. You can be a lifelong employee now, but you have to be a lifelong learner. I think the job of corporations is to make those classes and resources possible. The job of government is to nurture and encourage that. But Tim's job, my job, and all of our job is going to be to take those courses on our own time. 
That is the new social contract. What is an intelligent assistant? So the example I give for that is um, I spent a lot of time at Qualcomm, another important company you've probably not uh, focused on. It made the innards of your cell phone um, uh, and your Kindle. So uh, Qualcomm has a 64 building campus in San Diego and a few years ago they took six of those buildings and they put sensors everywhere on every faucet, light, door, window, air conditioner, heating system, computer. They know everything going on in those buildings. And then they beam all that data up to the supernova. And they beam it down on a very user-friendly interface on an iPad for their janitors. Uh, their janitors are now maintenance technologists because they have an intelligent assistant. They actually give tours to foreign visitors. Think what that does for the dignity and sense of self-worth of a maintenance person that they're now maintenance technologists because they have an intelligent assistant helping them live at a higher rate of change. My example of intelligent algorithms is the partnership between Khan Academy and um, the College Board, the people who administer the PSATs and the SAT exams. If you're a neurotic n n urban parent like uh, myself and my wife, uh, uh, when our kids were in 11th grade and had to take the PSAT, we went out and hired a tutor. Uh, we paid um, them $200 a, a shot uh, to uh, goose our daughter's uh, English and math scores on the SAT. Don't worry, I know you did it too. It's okay. Um, uh, a completely rigged game. Because if you come from a neighborhood or family that you don't even know this is possible, let alone have the resources for it, uh, you're really behind. A completely rigged game. Three years ago, the College Board and Khan Academy partnered to create free online PSAT and SAT prep. Uh, the way it works is Tim takes his PSAT exam in 11th grade, gets the results back from Khan Academy and says, Tim, Tim, Tim. You, you, you did really nicely here. You did really nicely. But you do have a problem with fractions and right angles. Uh, it then takes Tim to a practice site just devoted to fractions and right angles. Exactly his weakness. Doesn't waste time on all the stuff he's already mastered. Uh, if Tim does well there, it takes him to another site and says, you know, Tim, have you actually thought of taking AP math? Uh, well, it happens. No one in Tim's immediate family or surroundings ever took AP math. He didn't even know there was AP math. Now he says, I could take AP math. If he does well, it takes him to another site for over 180 college scholarships and another site where volunteers from the Boys and Girls Clubs of America are volunteering to coach these kids. It's an intelligent algorithm that last year, two million American kids availed themselves of for free SAT prep. Now, I'm willing to bet you didn't know about any of these things. Because if you followed our last election, you would have no idea um, this kind of social entrepreneurship is going on in the pipeline of education to work. Bernie Sanders' big idea was to take down the banks, take them apart. Donald Trump's big idea was to take apart Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton's big idea was to direct you to her website, okay? <laughs> but the fact is, the fact is there is massive social entrepreneurship going on inside companies and outside companies. My, I'm just giving you a fraction of the examples I cite in this chapter of the book. And it's incredibly exciting. But you would never know it. So let me share with you um, my, my chapter on politics, how um, politics is being reshaped by the age of acceleration. So my argument is that um, I think we're not in the middle of just one climate change. I think we're in the middle of three climate changes at once. We're in the middle of the change of the climate, climate. We're in the middle of the change of the climate of globalization. And we're in the middle of the change of the climate of technology. Technology is going from flat to fast. Globalization is going from hyper-connected to interdependent. And climate is going from later to now, because later will be too late. So we are in the middle of three giant climate changes at once. So I sat back and I said to myself, what do you want when the climate changes? Well, you want two things. You want resilience. You need to be able to take a blow because you get really disruptive events. But you also want propulsion. You want to be able to move ahead. You want to just be curled up in a ball. So then I thought, well, who do I interview about how you build resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? 
Then I realized I knew this woman. She's 3.8 billion years old, and her name's Mother Nature, and she dealt with more climate changes than anybody. So I called her up and invited her for an interview. I sat her down, and I said, Mother Nature, tell me, what are your strategies for building resilience when the climate changes? And she said, well, first of all, Tom, um, you have to understand, everything I do, I do unconsciously. Um, but here is what I do. Uh, first of all, I'm incredibly adaptive through natural selection, in a brutal way. Uh, but I'm incredibly adaptive. In my world, only the adaptive survive. Second, she said, uh, I, I love pluralism and diversity. Oh, my goodness. My most diverse ecosystems are my most resilient. I like to try 20 different species, see who wins. I love pluralism and diversity. A third, she says, I'm very sustainable, Every, in a very circular way. Everything is food. Eat food, poop seed, eat food, poop seed. I'm very sustainable. Uh, fourth, she said, I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Wherever I see a blank space in nature, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Fifth, she said, I'm incredibly heterodox. I think things should co-evolve. I'm very hybrid in my thinking. I put the right bees with the right flowers, the right trees with the right soils. There's nothing dogmatic in my world. Lastly, she said, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures and return them to the great manufacturer in the sky. And I take their energy to nourish my successes. My argument is that in the age of acceleration, the companies, the countries, the communities, the political parties that most closely mirror Mother Nature's strategies for producing resilience and propulsion when the climate changes are the ones that will thrive in this era. And then, just for the heck of it, I took it one step further and said, what if Mother Nature were running in this election? What would her political party look like? Okay. And of course, this is just a proxy for my own politics, but never mind, okay? <laughs> and I won't go into the whole platform, it's in the book, but I basically explain that um, my own politics, that I am on some issues actually to the left of Bernie Sanders. I think we should have single-payer health care if it can work for Singapore and Sweden. I fail to understand why we can't have it here, okay? But, but at the same time, at the very same time, I am to the right of the Wall Street Journal editorial page, because I believe we should abolish all corporate taxes and replace them with a carbon tax, a tax on sugar, a tax on bullets, and a small financial transaction tax, okay? So I, I want to get, get radically entrepreneurial over here to pay for what I think are, we're going to need more and healthier trampolines and safety nets over here because the age of acceleration is going to be too darn fast for some people. Now, unfortunately, in our system, if you're for radical entrepreneurship, you're against safety nets. And if you're against safety nets, you're against radical entrepreneurship. What would Mother Nature say? That's really stupid. These two things should co-evolve. They should co-evolve in the age of acceleration. And I do believe we are in the process of all our political parties blowing up right now because they were all designed here, Europe, and elsewhere. They were all designed for the New Deal, the Industrial Revolution, the early IT revolution, and civil rights, both racial and gender. And I believe what a political party has to be designed around in the future is how you respond to these three accelerations, how you get the most out of them, and cushion the worst for the most people. And that's what the chapter is about. Let me conclude with um, uh, talking about the chapter on ethics, since we're here in this, this lovely church. Um, the chapter is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Excuse me. Best question I ever got on book tour. <clears throat> I was positive it was Portland, Oregon. In 1999, I'm selling Lexus in the olive tree. Man stands up in the balcony and says, uh, Mr. Friedman, I have a question. Is God in cyberspace? I said, I, 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 oh, I have no idea. Um, I've never been asked that question before. Is God in cyberspace? 
So I got home and I called my spiritual teacher, um, Tzvi Mark. He's a wonderful rabbi. I met at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem when I was the New York Times correspondent there. He now lives in Amsterdam. He's a great Talmudic scholar, married to a Dutch priest, very interesting guy. And um, uh, I called him in Amsterdam, tracked him down. I said, Tzvi, I got a question I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have said? And he said, well, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty. Uh, one is the Almighty is Almighty. Uh, he smites evil and rewards good. Um, that's the biblical concept. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, prevarication, and we now know fake news, okay? Um, but he said, fortunately, we have a post-biblical view of God, and the post-biblical view of God says God manifests himself by how we behave. If we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. That's the only way God is going to get there. Well, I wrote all that up, put it into the paperback edition of Lexus and the Olive Tree where nobody saw it, and I basically tucked it away for 20 years. Well, I started working on this book, and suddenly I found myself meeting with audiences and retelling that story. And I finally sat myself down and said, why, why are you retelling that story? And it immediately became obvious to me, because since I wrote that book in 1999, everything has moved to cyberspace. It's now where we find a date, where we meet a spouse, where we encounter our friends and family. It's where we educate, do commerce, and govern. But what does that mean? It means our lives have migrated to a realm where we're all connected but nobody's in charge. And boy, didn't we learn that in this election? <laughs> Fake news, the hacking of our democracy. We're all connected there, but nobody was in charge. No red lights, no great houses of worship. This is going to be a real problem. So I thought about, where are we right now? in this age of accelerations. We're actually standing at a moral intersection we have never stood at before as a human species. In 1945, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us post Hiroshima. If it had to be one country, I'm glad it was America. I think we're entering a world, entering a world, where one person can kill all of us and all of us could actually fix everything. This age of acceleration and the amplification of powers it is fostering are create, is creating a world where one of us could kill all of us and all of us could actually feed, house, clothe, and educate every person on the planet if we put our minds to it. We have never lived in such a world where one of us could kill all of us and all of us could fix everything. What does it mean? What does it mean, Tim? It means we have never been more godlike as a species. And if we are going to be more godlike, we all better embrace the golden rule, or whatever version your faith has. Do unto others as you wish them to do unto you, because we now live in a world where more people can do unto us farther away and faster, including hack our election, than ever before. And we live in a world where we can do unto others faster than ever. Everybody needs to embrace the golden rule. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Because I actually gave this part of my talk as the commencement address at Olin College of Engineering last spring. And I said to the parents, I know what you're thinking. You paid 200 grand so your kid could get an engineering degree. And there's a knucklehead commencement speaker <laughs> who's promoting the golden rule. <laughs> Is there anything more naive? And I am here to tell you that in the age of acceleration, naivete is the new realism. Because I'll tell you what's really naive. Thinking we're going to be just fine if we don't scale the golden rule in a world where individuals are this super empowered and we are this interdependent. And that's, friends, what brought me back to Minnesota. Because um, where does the golden rule come from? I think it comes from two places. It comes from strong families, 
and healthy communities. That's where you learn to do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. I'm not an expert on strong families. I hope I've built one, but I would never presume to lecture anyone on that. But what I said to the readers of this book, I am kind of an expert on healthy communities because I grew up in one, St. Louis Park. And that sets up the last two chapters of the book, which are about St. Louis Park 40 years ago and St. Louis Park today. So I basically explained to the readers that um, uh, the Jews in Minnesota basically all lived on the north side uh, with African Americans in the 30s and 40s. That's my parents were born and raised and went to school. Um, in the Minneapolis, unfortunately, was the capital of anti-Semitism um, uh, in the 40s until some really important political leaders stood up, like Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale, and uh, turned that tide. My parents couldn't join AAA um, uh, in the 50s. Uh, in the mid-50s, all the Jews basically move out of North Minneapolis en masse in three years. And they all moved to one suburb that had the housing stock and didn't have restricted covenants. They all moved to St. Louis Park. So if you can imagine this, this uh, suburb, this little town, uh, which was 100% basically Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian, and Northern European, uh, overnight becomes 20% Jewish, 80% Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian. If Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park, okay? <laughs> so, um, uh, and what you get um, in this crazy chemical reaction between these neurotic Jews and these incredibly decent pluralistic Scandinavians and Northern Europeans, you get this incredible explosion. Um, and so I went to, and I tell the story of living in the same neighborhood or growing up or going to the same Hebrew school or the whole public school system uh, with the Cone brothers, Al Franken, Norm Mornstein, Michael Sandel, Sharon Isbin, the guitarist, um, uh, Mark Tressman, the football coach. He was our high school quarterback. Uh, the Cone, I said them, um, uh, Dan Wilson, who wrote Someone Like You with Adele, uh, uh, Peggy Ornstein, Alan Wiseman, who wrote The World Without Us. Adam, it was an explosion of just creativity in this Little, it's not a neighborhood in the Upper West Side in New York. This is a one high school town. Uh, and we were all the beneficiaries of incredible leaders of all faiths who decided they want to build a community of inclusion and pluralism. They were amazing, amazing leaders. You don't know their names, but their names are in my book. Because whenever people ask me, St. Louis Park, what was the deal there? Did, was there a moat around it? Um, <laughs> was there a drawbridge? Was there a wall? No, what distinguished it was leadership. Uh, and a million acts of generous leadership. That, that's my conclusion. So I come back 40 years later to my same high school. And this is the last chapter. I left St. Louis Park to discover the world in 1971, and I came back 40 years later and discovered the world had found St. Louis Park. Now my high school is 50% white Protestant Catholic, 10% Hispanic, 10% Jewish, and 30% Somali and African American. And I tell the story about how they're doing. And they're actually doing amazingly well. Oh, do they have problems and challenges? No question. But there's nothing like interviewing a young Somali girl and having her tell you about her first bat mitzvah party. Um, <laughs> o only, only in Minnesota, OK? How are they doing? They got a lot of challenges. By the way, I don't know how it's going to come out. And I also tell the story of the Northside Achievement Zone in Minneapolis and the Itasca group. Because they're all, what they all have in common is something that my teacher and friend, Amory Lovins, a great physicist, taught me. Because whenever people ask Amory, are you an optimist or a pessimist? He says, I'm neither. Because they're just two different forms of fatalism. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be awful. <laughs> what Amory says is, I believe in applied hope. I believe in applied hope. What I see in Minneapolis today with all its challenges, what I see in St. Louis Park today with all its challenges, and frankly, what I see in many communities around our country are a lot of people applying hope. Don't know if it's going to get done, 
but I'm so impressed with the number of people who want to get caught trying. And that's the story I tell. For me, if you want to be an optimist about America, stand on your head, because the country looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down, okay? <laughs> uh, because uh, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I see people in communities applying hope. And that's why I will conclude with my book's theme song. I won't sing it for you. My book has a theme song. I thought, could I buy this so when you open the book, it would play this song like a Hallmark card plays Happy Birthday. Uh, and the song is by Brandi Carlisle. She's a wonderful country folk singer. And the main refrain is, the song is called, excuse me, The Eye. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. I believe the three accelerations I've charted, they are a hurricane. They are a hurricane. There are some people, some politicians in this country who want to build a wall against the hurricane. My argument is you need to build an eye. The eye is the healthy community, a place where everyone can feel connected, protected, and respected. It moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but is a platform of dynamic stability that moves forward with and in the wind. I believe the great struggle in American politics for the next four years is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. And my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Friedman, from the Westminster Town Hall Forum.